My name is Nicola Stanley, I'm the Canon Presenter at Bristol Cathedral. Welcome to this short presentation about our beautiful cathedral. I've been here for nearly seven years and I never cease to be amazed at the beauty of this building and to know what a privilege it is to work here. In case you don't know what a Canon Presenter is, it's the person in the cathedral who's responsible for the liturgy and worship. So my responsibility is any service from two people to 1,200, in better times, of course. So a very brief history about this cathedral. It was first built in 1140, and the chapter house, which is reputedly the best in the country, was completed around the year 1160. Do come and visit if you would like to. It was an Augustinian abbey, so it had canons here and it enclosed quite a large part of the centre of the city of Bristol. If you've ever been to Bristol, you'll know the part which is called College Green, which is a large green space in front of the cathedral. Recently, unfortunately, that's been in the news because of protests, but it is very much the centre of the city, and the cathedral actually owns that, and in days gone by, it was a burial ground for the canons who worked and worshipped here. So at the time of the Reformation, the Norman nave was considered outdated. So they had knocked it down and it was built up to about shoulder height. Of course, along came the Reformation, the work was never completed and the nave wasn't actually finished until 400 years later, when finally the Victorians demolished the streets which had by then grown up where the nave was and rebuilt the nave. Looking at it, you'd never know it wasn't built at the same time as the east end of the cathedral. But for a very long time, Bristol Cathedral was just a tiny cathedral. It was the east end of what we know now. We try to maintain the monastic tradition of spirituality. So every single day we have three services, morning prayer, evening prayer and a Eucharist. This has been quite a challenge, as you can imagine, during the pandemic but we have maintained that more or less, just a very odd break. I'm not quite sure when other breaks have occurred during the cathedral's history, but I suspect they probably have. But as soon as we were able to, we have reinstated those three services. And as presenter, I was really anxious that the tradition wouldn't drop on my watch. So the pandemic has been a challenge, but we've been live streaming an awful lot. We've been pre-recording and broadcasting an awful lot. You may well have chosen to tune in to what we've offered. And I think that um, we haven't done too badly. And I'm really very grateful, particularly to our Virgin team, who have spent a lot of time getting to grips with new technology. The mission of this cathedral is to reach out to those with the love of God who live in our city and beyond. Bristol is, as you will have gathered from recent news events, a rather divided city, and it's surprising how many people have yet to set foot in the cathedral. So it's our mission to reach out to them and to persuade people, to tell people that the cathedral is for them, it's their cathedral. When they do come in, maybe as children with their school or as visitors as part of a, a, a group being guided around, they're always absolutely amazed by what they find. We have a fantastic choir, um, really, really world class, and what a privilege it is to work with our choir. And our mission again is to offer worship of an excellent standard. We really do try to do that. And of course, we know that God forgives our mistakes, but we try nonetheless to do everything to the very, very best of our ability. The cathedral isn't up there in terms of visitor numbers with Salisbury, York, Minster, Westminster Abbey. But surprisingly, we've discovered recently that we are the third most visited attraction in the city of Bristol. We know that because we installed a people counter and we did have, before the pandemic, just short of half a million visitors a year, which is quite astonishing. 
we're working now on improving the experience that they'll have when they come to the cathedral. We want to tell them about what happens here in an interactive way. And um, that does pose challenges because we're quite determined to be a cathedral that doesn't charge for entry. So I hope that that's filled you in on a little of what Bristol Cathedral is about. I'm very grateful to my colleague Peter Wagstaff for recording this and he is going to add some other bits to what I've already said which will be more attractive to look at. So thank you for joining me. I'm recording this at the start of Holy Week so I pray that you will be given grace this Holy Week to deny yourselves, to take up your cross and to follow Christ and that you will share in the joy of the resurrection this Easter. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Yes, hello, I'm Peter Wagstaff. By day, I'm an historian, but by evening, I work for Bristol Cathedral as a lay clerk in the cathedral choir and as a tour guide. I'm here to give you a potted history of Bristol Cathedral and the life of the cathedral in a nutshell. The Augustinian Abbey of St. Augustine, doubly Augustinian because the canons lived by the rule of St. Augustine of Hippo, and the abbey was dedicated to Augustine of Canterbury, was founded by royal charter in 1140. The man responsible for it was Robert Fitzharding, a wealthy Bristol nobleman whose lineage predated the Norman aristocracy back to Saxon times. Fitzharding had backed the right horse in the civil wars of the early 12th century and ended up as Henry II's right-hand man in the West. He became Lord of Berkeley. His knightly descendants are buried in elaborate and unique star-shaped tombs in Fitzharding's Abbey at Bristol, and his progeny live still in unbroken line of descent at Berkeley Castle to this day. A little about the architecture. Like many British cathedrals, the original abbey was built in the Norman Romanesque style before being renovated in the newer Gothic style. In 1220, the first of these renovations took place in the form of the Elder Lady Chapel, which remains one of the first and finest examples of very early English Gothic. The rest of the east portion of the building was rebuilt a century later in the decorated Gothic style, with occasional flourishes of perpendicular Gothic. Original portions of Romanesque do survive though, most notably in the Chapter House, which is the most intact and spectacular example of a Norman chapter house to survive in Britain. As Canon Nicola has already touched on, the rebuilding of the nave was not completed before the dissolution struck in 1539. The defunct Abbey of St. Augustine was reopened in 1542 as the Cathedral Church of the Holy and Undivided Trinity in the newly minted Diocese of Bristol. Bristol's new diocesan status was supposedly down to complaints from the wealthy Bristol burghers who didn't want to be outdone by Gloucester, which had just received its own diocesan status. Both cities and both magnificent abbeys had previously been in the Diocese of Worcester. For 400 years, Bristol was the smallest cathedral in the UK until the Victorians launched a project to build a new nave, matching in style the eastern portion. To this day, onlookers are always surprised to learn the nave is not contemporary to the rest of the building. The Victorians did such a good job. Of Bristol Cathedral's many unique features, the final one I'll note here is its hall church structure. A hall church is one whose side aisles are the same height as the central nave. In Britain, Gothic churches always have lower vaulted side aisles. A local famous example, of course, is St Mary Redcliffe, only half a mile from the cathedral. A hall church is reasonably common on the continent, particularly in Germany, but Bristol Cathedral is unique in Britain. The high aisles mean the system of flying buttresses usually employed by Gothic cathedrals to keep the ceiling up can't work, 
So the cathedral architects came up with an ingenious, and again unique, solution. Flying buttresses inside the building. The high aisles of the Hall Church lend Bristol an especially large and airy feel inside, something of a TARDIS cathedral, and creates an acoustic which, for choral music especially, is second to none in Britain. Now, a few words about the people who lived and worshipped here. Most monastic foundations in Europe were not entirely independent, but were connected to mother houses, the most famous being the French Abbey of Cluny, which maintained Cluniac Benedictine monasteries across Europe. Bristol's mother abbey, however, was that of St Victor in Paris, an Augustinian foundation which was the de facto first college of the University of Paris. The peculiar feature of Victorine canons, both in Paris and in Bristol, was their preoccupation with education. These were no reclusive Benedictines. Victorine canons believed that a wide education, not just in theology, but in history, philosophy, languages, art and music, and much more, didn't distract from the worship of God, but enlightened our understanding of God. To learn more about the truth in God's world is, for the Victorines, to share in the knowledge and love of God. This concern for education undoubtedly contributed to the very early foundation of the Cathedral School, which has been around in some form or another more or less since the foundation of the Abbey itself. So rare in the introverted scholastic environment of early Middle Ages Christianity. I find this preoccupation with liberal education fascinating. If you'd like to learn more, do search out the writings of the early Victorian canons, especially the Didascalion of Hugh of St Victor, which in the 13th century explains how education, even in what we would now call science, is crucial to our relationship with and understanding of God. That's all from me. If you'd like to learn more about Bristol Cathedral, do look up the video blog series I'm currently running called the Top 10 Countdown of Lockdown Treasures from Bristol Cathedral. A link is on your screen. Do also get in touch with myself or Canon Nicola via the Cathedral website. I leave you now to enjoy for a few more moments the spectacular acoustic of the Eastern Lady Chapel of Bristol Cathedral. The cathedral lay clerks and choral scholars singing The Lamentations of Jeremiah by Thomas Tallis, recorded live in a Compline service during Holy Week a few years ago. Mm -hmm.